Welcome back, everyone, to the Seasonal Wrap-Up Show. It's time to dive into some Fall 2021 anime. Um, now, normally, um, like I said at the end of the last video, normally what I do is I'll pull up a randomizer and just pull out a number from any of these and go to town. But I want to get a little bit of a head start on some of these uh, because these first five here are already finished or are very close to finishing. I'm recording this, I think, like uh, four or five days before the last episode of Blue Period. So I'm going to just binge these first five in the order that I have here. We got a short series, um, a movie, a Netflix series, and then two TV series. All of a pretty decent genre spread. So that'll be a good introduction for the fall season. So we're going to start right here with Ganbare Doki-chan. I believe it's from the same author as Miru Tights, I think. So uh, let's give it a whirl. All right, I just finished all of um, Ganbare Doki-chan. Um, gotta be honest, I was not expecting to like this one. Wasn't a fan of Miru Tights, which is by the same author. Uh, but this one was surprisingly wholesome. Except for the first episode. The first episode was like... Weirdly out of place in terms of the humor. Because the first episode is basically like... Why didn't you assault me in my sleep? But the rest of the episodes are like... Pretty standard, fair workplace rom-com kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it was cute. Doki-chan is cute, um, her co-workers are extremely fucking hot, and that, that's the kind of show this is. I am, this is good at she. This is, like, artistically speaking, this animation-wise, like, to be honest, it's, I find it hard to find good at she nowadays. I just don't see it a lot of the time. Like, it, like, when a show really shoots for the etchy, I often find myself put off by it. I just not don't dig it really much. But this was very much good etchy. I was having a good time with it. Uh, and there are only, like, five to six minute episodes, so you'll be done with this in, like, an hour or so if you just binge it front to back. I think there's a special airing next week, so I'll... Tune in for that as well, but uh, yeah, I was hoping for a, a like concrete romance at the end of it because they're very clearly into each other. Like by the end of it, the guy is very obviously into the girl, so it's like just make the romance, just do it. I'm tired of getting cock blocked by the not rom by the not relationship stuff, but other than that. I had a good old, nice old time. It was... I didn't feel like I was waste... Like I was bored out of my mind. And I didn't feel like the etchy was bad at all. It was good etchy. And the comedy was surprisingly strong. Would recommend. So, yeah. That's about all I have to say on that one. Let's go back to the list. Alright. Doki-chan is done. We're gonna put it... Let's put it... Hmm... Um, Right here. Yeah. Seems a little low depend based on where I put it, but I mean, wasn't like a super standout thing. I, I enjoyed myself for what it was, and I wish the romance was a little more concrete. If the romance had been concrete by the end, it definitely would have been a 7. But, um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Would recommend. So, let's move on to... Words bubble up like soda pop. This one's a movie directed by Kyohei Ishiguro, I believe, who is the director of Your Lie in April. So I am hype. Let's watch a movie. All right, well, I got about 35-ish minutes into uh, Words Bubble Up Like Soda Pop. Um, I don't think I'm going to finish this one. I don't dislike this movie, per se. It's like a smack dab 5 out of 10 movie. Um... For wildly different reasons, both narratively and visually. Visually, this is a pretty solid film. Like, there's a lot of really cool 
color work, really good des character designs, animation super good. There's some really cool like animation set pieces. This film feels much more like it's geared towards cool animation concepts than it is a interesting story cuz like this we'll get to the story in a sec, but like there's this like skateboard sequence in a mall in the opening scene that's just really coolly shot and animated and storyboarded. Really impressive, technically. Um, um, and I, again, I just the overall look of the movie I really like. The I thought I was gonna love this movie based on the opening scene alone, cause like it does so much visually and cinematically to tell you about the characters without them having to explain it to you. Like the opening uh, couple minutes of this movie is like a so like a perfect like show don't tell kind of thing like there it's very good at showing and not just explaining everything very impressive cinematically but the story overall is just not that interesting i guess it's very much geared towards like a young teen or like preteen audience is what I'm seeing this film geared towards. Like, uh, the main guy is, like, very socially awkward, but he loves writing haikus, or hi hi <laughs> hi haikus, not haikus, he's not Furudate sensei. <laughs> oh god, I have, I have anime brain. Oh Jesus. Um, but like he he really likes writing haikus um but he's like super socially awkward and the main girl has just gotten braces because she's got like buck teeth which is something i haven't seen before in anime as far as i can tell i don't remember seeing braces on anyone before in anime except maybe like a real little kid or something. I I just don't remember it all. So I guess it's a first for me in seeing it in anime, but um it feels very like universal child experiences, growing pains and stuff like that. Being socially awkward, having to get braces, um and having to deal with like having fucking metal mouth. Um it's fine. It's like a light to solid five um the one thing that i was that actually off put me about this surprisingly was the music and we'll get to why that's surprising in a second but like it just has that very typical like feel good animated movie score like where it's just a straight like a upbeat kind almost like a if like a if like a compo uh, background music was a pop song, you know what I mean? Where it's got, like, the, the like, background vocals and stuff, and it's got this super upbeat feel. You've seen it in, like, every fucking... The trailer for every um, animated film that comes out in the West. That kind of sound. Um, so imagine my shock when I find out it's fucking Kensuke Ushio, who is the composer for this movie. I'm like, you composed for Liz and the Bluebird. How did you churn out this garbage? What the fuck, my dude? Uh, so that was a bit of a shock. Um, it's, I almost feel like someone told him that he had to put that kind of track in the film. Like, that seems so far outside his, uh, typical, right, com music composition style. It was weird. But, um, I wouldn't not recommend this movie i'm not gonna say i definitely wouldn't say you should need to go out and see it but if you're like if you want like a feel good kind of romance slice of life movie i didn't even really get to any of the romance stuff i did feel like the the inciting incident of the meeting was a little contrived like it's the very typical like whoops our phone cases kind of look similar so we uh, we dropped our phones and we swapped them whoopsies but I, I feel like I would have bought it more if their phones had actually looked similar, but there's a very obvious difference in their phones. Um, I get that she, like, picked hers up in a panic because her braces got revealed, so I understand, I understand it, but it was, like, it was, like, a small detail that needed to, that could have been tweaked a little bit. Um... 
So, yeah, I didn't even get to the romance elements, so I can't tell you how good those are. But, uh, if any of, if you just want, like, a solid, feel-good kind of movie for, young, for a younger audience, go ahead and check this out. I don't feel like watching any more of it, so let's go back to the list. Alright, we're gonna take Soda Pop off the list. And up next we have Super Crooks. This is like a like an aid episode-ish thing on Netflix or something, so let's see how it goes. I can't tell if I'm prejudiced against adaptations of American comics or if I just don't like Sato Dai. Because apparently he also did the script for the previous one, Soda Pop, and now he did the series comp for Super Crooks. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not digging this one at all. It's, first of all, it's fucking ugly. This is an ugly show. I cannot believe Bones made this. I am, I am blown away by how not Bones this is. There's like a cool... I made, I made it like 15 minutes into the first episode. There was like one cool cut of like when he's like putting his costume together. That looked pretty nice. But otherwise, this is an ugly ass fucking show. Now granted, they're working off of an Am the character designs from an American comic. Uh, specifically a Mark Miller comic. So, they d I guess they did have to stick kind of close. Well, no, they didn't have to stick to those designs. They could have animified the shit out of it. They could have if they wanted to, but I guess they just didn't. I want They wanted to stay true to the source material, I guess, which is fine, but it looks ugly as a result. Um, and again, me being prejudiced against American comics, I don't give a shit, but is it just me, or does everyone fucking copy Spider-Man for some reason? Like, in terms of, like, the personality type. Like, I, you saw it, I saw it in Invincible, the, and now I see it here. The fucking, just the little kind of semi-nerd loser kid who gets picked on by the school bullies. Um, and then suddenly he gets superpowers. I, I, I've seen it before. It was better when Spider-Man did it. It was better than Mido when Midoriya did it in My Hero. Um, I, yeah, I, I really don't have much to say about this. Mostly because I was so fucking bored and put off by it for like the first 15 minutes. So, um, I know this one's kind of a contentious series. I guess some people really like it and some people don't like it. Um, I guess I am firmly in the don't like it camp, mostly because it's fucking ugly. This is an ugly fucking show. Goddamn. Let's move on. Alright, we're gonna take Super Crooks off of the list. And next is Heike Monogatari. I am super excited for this one. It's uh, Naoko Yamada's uh, post Annie directorial work, her first one without KyoAni, and apparently it's a very important story in Japanese mythology and history, so let's jump right into it. Alright, just finished all of Heike Monogatari, and that was really fucking good. That was some good, good shit. Um, definitely reminded me that I need to do a little bit more research into Japanese history if I want to enjoy more shows like this because uh, so if you're unfamiliar the tale of the Heike is what this um, is what Heike Monogatari is based on which is like this old old um, Japanese uh, story piece of historical slash folk or maybe so, something like that. Um, I forgot who it was who described it to me this way, but it was essentially that uh, the, the tale of the Heike is essentially the influential, the Japanese influential equivalent of the King Arthur myth for Western, for English mythology and English history. So, 
And you can definitely see that a little bit. Like, obviously, this is a... Naoko Yamada directed this one, and she... From what I've heard, she took a lot of liberties with certain things, but you can still see, like, some very core storytelling tropes in it. Very core Japanese storytelling tropes in it. Uh, especially with the character uh, Shigemori, who is the best boy does nothing wrong uh, and he is awesome <laughs> um, but I do like the uh, addition the very obvious additional elements to this in that being these the slight supernatural elements to it with the our main character Biwa can see the future of different people and it sort of adds like a different it adds a cool thematic element to it of uh, this character not being able to do anything except tell the story of the people she meets and the people whose lives intersect with her. I thought that was a really cool, really cool idea and it's executed really solidly. Um, this is a surprisingly un-anime story though. Or I guess I shouldn't say surprisingly since this story is, this story has existed well before anime as a concept. Uh, but it's a very much a very much a political drama kind of series. Like it's this guy betrays this general, this guy burns down this capital, so on and so forth. Treachery is afoot and everything. Um, uh, it really shows some, and yeah, it's just some good political drama to it. Although I will. I guess this is my mildly hot take on this. Uh, I thought the first main bulk of the series was better than the last couple episodes. Like, a lot of people have been hyping up the last couple episodes of it as being really good, and I was just like, yeah, it was good. Uh, but I liked the before stuff. Uh, I really liked all the character drama amongst everyone in the Heike clan um I liked how so many different personalities have been developed for this story and how they all interconnect in different ways um just seeing different characters grow over time um and I guess like my mild complaint about the ending is that it felt a little dragged out ish I guess no, not dra dragged out is the wrong word. Um, I'm trying to be specific about this. Uh, they put fan. They put a little too much fanfare into the raw. No, that's not it. It just didn't hit for me. That's I'd have to watch it again to see exactly what didn't work for me. But it, it's again, I'm nitpicking at this point because I fucking love this series. Mostly because this is a fucking phenomenal looking series and a phenomenally directed series. The pacing is so fucking tight and captivating. The shot composition is so fucking good. There are so many amazing shots in this show that just wrap enrapture you. The animation is really good, really fucking great. Love the color work for this. This is, uh,. Again, this is Naoko Yamada at Science Saru, which was um, Yuasa's studio. Um, I will say, though, on the ending, the last episode definitely started to show the, the Science Saru um, faults, as it were. There are some very... There are some things that Science Saru specifically does when they're... When they... Qu can't quite get a shot movement right for something and it is very prevalent in episode 11 the final episode mostly because there's just so much shit happening i guess that's another reason why i wasn't as hype about the ending is like the with the exception of like the last like five to six minutes the ending is mostly just a big battle and everyone dying <laughs> but and like you kind of I do like how they turned around uh, Biwa's prediction for Tokuko at the end. I do like that sort of bait and switch. Uh, 
with her there. But uh, I feel like there was a lot of stuff in that episode that just wasn't as interesting as the stuff that came before it. But again, these are some minor nitpicks. I really fucking like this show. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I was trying to think, like, just the overall... It's just a really tight, solid package. Just 11 episodes of good fucking shit. Uh... And I really appreciate that. Just that in and out, ah, uh, finished, finishedness of it. And it, this was a, this felt like a very ambitious project with so many different characters. Like I love so many of the characters in the show just because of so much nuance and care was paid to constructing them, how they talked, how they acted, how they moved, um, their personalities. So much good shit in this. Um, and it really just shows the arrogance of the Heike clan. In particular, the... I forgot what the main guy... The main clan head's name was. Kyo something. Uh, me being bad with anime names again. Who, who, could, who could have seen that coming? Uh, but, yeah. Uh, just really drives home that point of, like, the Hey K just completely undoing themselves. It was just all their arrogance and treachery that did them in in the end. Uh, in, in different ways, too. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, I would highly, highly recommend this series. I might watch it again sometime in the near future. Uh, oh, had a fucking great, uh... Kensuke Ushio score to it. Uh, he's been working with Naoko Yamada quite a bit lately, it seems. Um, there are a few, like, guitar, like, electric guitar tracks in here that, like, the first one in, like, the first episode doesn't fit at all, but, like, all the subsequent ones work really well, but the rest of the music is this really great ambiance-esque kind of stuff. Uses a lot of traditional instruments like the flute and the biwa and stuff like that. And then there's occasionally some solid orchestral moments. Um, really fucking good score. Set the tone per all, perfectly for almost every scene where there's accompanying music. Yeah, this sub uh, good shit. <sighs> Sorry, it's very late. I was I didn't want to stop watching it because it was so good. Uh, so yeah, that's Heike Monogatari. Highly recommend this one. I think this one is definitely going to end up in my top 10 for the year. So let's go back to the list. Alright, Heike Monogatari is finished. And we are going to put it right there. So, not quite top 5, but uh... Got pretty darn close. So we're gonna give that a light nine. I really liked that. I, uh, to be clear, this is all top tier shit right here. I am in love with pretty much all of this stuff. Um, so it is in good company here. So anyway, let's get back to the list. Um, continuing on with the last series that finished airing this week, um, we have Blue Period. Now, full disclosure, I dropped the manga for this. I just was not feeling how it was written, and everyone has been saying that the anime is significantly worse, so let's see how it goes. Alright, I just finished all of Blue Period. That was pretty dang fun. It was a good show. Now, um, to get the obvious point out of the way, this was this show has been uh, the anime specifically has been universally nag nagged on for being a bit low quality, especially in comparison to the manga, which is uh, admittedly very beautiful to look at. It is a gorgeous looking manga. Um, however, I dropped the manga, like fairly early on so it just did not 
grab me in the way that other pe it grabbed other people. So, the uh, I don't have this like reverence for the source material that a lot of other Blue Period fans do. Uh, so I enjoyed the anime quite a bit. It, uh, ironically, even though the animation was way lesser quality and the art, just general artistry of it was lesser than the manga, I just enjoyed it more as an anime. Um, most notably because the anime has something that the manga simply couldn't have, which is color. Um, I know you, but like, even though there's like, even in the anime, there's like a specific point where they say like a painting can still look good if you make it monochrome, like black and white. Like there's a specific line in that in the, in the show. Even that, despite that, you still lose a lot of the essence of painting when you take away the color. So that was one of my big gripes with the manga is just that I did not see... I could not fully appreciate the artistry of the painting in the manga because it's just black and white and you can't see the full depth of it. Um, and so being able to see that in the anime was really cool. And just... And it, the actual paintings in the anime looked really fucking good. Um, that was easily the biggest artistic strength of the series. Like, overall, the animation, like the character designs and such, weren't, were average to slightly below average. There were some, there were definitely some standout moments. Like, I think episode four in particular had some really great uh, color design and directing in it. But, uh, yeah. Um, I just, I just don't, was not as upset by this as fans of the manga were. Uh, in terms of story, it was extremely compelling as well. Lo uh, I just, again, with the manga, I just couldn't quite get invested in how the story was being told, I guess. I just wanted to, just, just something about the anime grabbed me over the manga. Um, I found Yagichi to be an extremely endearing character, um... It definitely felt like there was some stuff cut from the manga. There were definitely parts where it felt rushed. So, again, I can understand why manga fans are upset by this adaptation. But I don't give a shit about the manga, so I am not bothered by it. Um, felt a little rushed at times, but I still really empathized a lot with, the <coughs> with, the, with all the characters in the show really touches on some really great ideas about art and being an artist and just the general artistic pursuit. There are so many lines that these characters have uh, thought that I have thought myself as a YouTuber who creates um, my own brand of art, essentially. Um, and so it is an extreme... It really hits on the artist the ideas of artistry in some really cool and very deep ways that I found very um, satisfying. Uh, yeah, I think that's really all I have to say. This is a good show. It's a good fucking show. Loved, the, loved pretty much all the characters. Oh, we had fucking Yume, I think her name's Yume Miyamoto, the voice actress, as uh, Kuwana, I think was the character's name. Um... She's the same actress who did Rika in Gridman. I fucking love every time she shows up and stuff now, because I guess she has, like, a live-action acting background, so her voice is very distinct, very not anime. Very, always feels like a breath of fresh air when I hear her uh, in a show. Uh, yeah, just generally, this was a fun one. Um, left off in a way where it's like I would be... Con I would, I'm fine with it if there is no season two, but I would definitely like a season two. It leaves off in the perfect spot for that with... Oh, there was one thing that I was uh, a little annoyed by, that the Yaguchi gets sick, just so happens to get sick on the first day of the exams. Um, like, I, I understand that it was like a, a stress-induced, like thing from working so hard on his art, but it was, the the timing made it feel a little cliche, and just, well, quite, wasn't quite a fan of that, but, uh, 
yeah, Gen generally a solid show. I'm not, I wasn't super blown away by it. Again, I had some issues here and there, and the animation was not quite up to par. If this animation had been better, this would have, I would have been much more captivated by it. But, uh, yeah, hopefully, if it gets a season two, it'll be animated a little better. Uh, who knows? But for now, let's go back to the list. All right, Blue Period is done. I'm going to take that off the list, and we're going to put it right uh, right in here. Right here between Wonder Egg and Demon Slayer. So we'll do that, and we're going to give that a decent 7, if I can type properly. Um, good show. Could have been better. Uh, especially animation-wise, but uh, it was good. I enjoyed myself.